The Pittsburgh Steelers Football Club was founded by Arthur J. Rooney in 1933. Rooney's early Steelers were a hardy band of pioneers who lured curious fans into old Forbes Field to watch Jock Sutherland's wide open single wing. The names were Bullet Bill Dudley, Johnny Blood, and Byron Wizard White. And while they never won a title, they did introduce Pittsburgh to NFL excitement. In the 50s, the scene shifted to Pitt Stadium. The names changed to Stautner, Hope, Butler, and Shadnoy. But for all their promise, the Steelers were never quite cut of championship timber. In 1969, an unknown young coach named Chuck Knoll arrived to try his hand where 11 others had failed. Knoll worked no sudden miracles. His first Steeler team was 1-13, and, and at one point, the losing streak reached 16 straight. But Noel was patiently laying a foundation for future greatness. Pittsburgh coaches and scouts were constructing a champion in the NFL draft. Pittsburgh on the first round selects Lynn Swan, wide receiver, Southern California. In six seasons of judicious drafting, Pittsburgh went from 1 and 13 to a silver Super Bowl salute for the man who started it all. This is the story of the building of a team. Executives, scouts, coaches, and players rising together to a world championship, then defending that title. This is the story of the Pittsburgh Steeler blueprint for victory. For San Diego head coach Tommy Prothro, opening day only brought severe anxieties, and the reason was obvious. The psyched-up Pittsburgh Steelers were in town, and as young Chargers were soon to be harshly shown the way of the world champions. And all three Charger quarterbacks were thrown into the pack of frenzied Steeler defenders. And, as you can see, it was a terrifying experience for all of them. So emphatically did the Steelers clamp down that at games in, the Chargers had never advanced beyond the Pittsburgh 40-yard line. With the defense maintaining its shutout intensity throughout the game, Terry Bradshaw was dealing an equally hot hand for the offense. His game stats, 21 for 28 for 219 yards. Forced to punt only twice during the game, there was lots of time for Steeler touchdowns, and the first one was airmail. Bradshaw to Frank Lewis. A repeat look at that play clearly shows the interference infraction and the beauty of a perfect play. The second Steeler TD came on a screen to Frenchy Fuqua whose end zone fumble was recovered by teammate Jerry Mullins for the score. But there was nothing sloppy about the next score as Terry Bradshaw launched his second touchdown pass. This one to number 82, John Stallworth. The defending world champions wrapped up their gaudy 443 yards of offense when number 44 Mike Collier rambled into the San Diego end zone to punctuate a 37 to nothing declaration. The Steelers are still number one. A Simpson, the big play is an every Sunday occurrence. It's expected. His trophy case is full, but O.J. Simpson still dreams of playing in a Super Bowl. Last week, the reigning champion Pittsburgh Steelers had Buffalo pinned deep in its own territory. The fired-up Steeler defense threatened to take the momentum away from the Bills. Instead, the juice evaporated the vaunted Steeler defense's mystique.
Simpson said he wanted to show a few folks just how fast he really was. A repeat of the play shows how O.J. got the opportunity. Anticipating the line plunge, safety man Glenn Edwards, cornerback J.T. Thomas, and all-pro corner linebacker Jack Ham bunched up in a short yardage defense. Ham and Edwards collided with one another trying to seal off the outside. Simpson capitalized on their over-anxiousness, beating Thomas to the sideline and setting the stage for a flat-out sprint to the end zone. On the day, the juice got loose for 227 yards, the most ever against the Steelers in the team's 43-year history. For O.J., it marked the fourth time he surpassed 200 yards rushing in a single game. The Buffalo offense amassed 434 total yards, 310 of it on the ground, the most yardage ever surrendered by a Chuck Knoll coach defense. Wide receiver Bob Chandler earned his flying wings this season after playing behind Ahmad Rashad and J.D. Hill in 1974. His precision patterns and deceptive speed add a new dimension to the Bills' attack. The offense once dominated by O.J. Simpson now shows depth and balance. With other new faces like Buffalo's number one pick in 1974, tight end Reuben Gant. Deservedly, on a day when neither its offense nor its defense did anything right, a Steelers special team provided the hometown fans with some excitement. Relief pitcher Joe Gillum rescued starter Terry Bradshaw in time to loft this touchdown pass to reserve tight end Randy Grossman. Gillum got his shot after starter Terry Bradshaw lost control of the Steeler offense and surrendered without a fight. Earl Edwards recovered Bradshaw's giveaway. During the course of the afternoon, the fired up Bill defense forced several Steeler turnovers. And through it all, Bradshaw and Edwards saw quite a bit of each other. The frustrated right-hander just couldn't find the range, so he went to his short passing game. And one of those passes went to the fifth member of the backfield, Earl Edwards. Mike Kadish's touchdown scamper contributed to a 31-20 Buffalo victory. The win had been the Steelers' thrashing of the Bills in the 74 playoffs. Quarterback story was developing in Cleveland, where number 15, Mike Phipps, has had only limited success in his six-year professional career. Inexperience hurts anywhere, but especially in an offensive line which has to deal with people like number 68. L.C. Greenwood, one of the most valuable players in Super Bowl IX. On the other hand, the Pittsburgh offensive line gave Terry Bradshaw playbook perfect protection. Bradshaw took advantage to complete his first seven passes of the game, including several to his super second-year wide receiver, Lynn Swan, number 88. Bradshaw also effectively used his other super second-year wide receiver, John Stallworth, number 82. Bradshaw, Swan, and Stallworth led the Steelers to a 21-0 first-half advantage. But then Bradshaw was forced out with a cut hand. And Joe Gilliam, number 17, finished up in style with two more touchdown bombs. 
one of them to fancy stepping Lynn Swan. They bombed us right out of our minds, said Coach Forrest Gregg of the Winless Browns. The final bombing run of the afternoon was launched by Jefferson Street Joe to still another second year wide receiver, Reggie Garrett, number 86, as the world champion Steelers rebounded from their embarrassing defeat of the previous week to crush Cleveland 42 to 6. The AFC Central rival Steelers were punishing the Denver Broncos with their 11 intimidators known by most as the Steel Curtain. Pittsburgh KO'd the Denver scoring attack, refusing even a touchdown. The Steelers choked off attempts by running star Otis Armstrong to regain the magic which last season enabled him to lead the NFL in rushing. Virtually every avenue of escape was obstructed as Armstrong was constantly turned back until a pulled hamstring forced him out of the game. For Otis Armstrong, attempts to regain his luster of last season have been both painful and frustrating. But while one runner failed in Pittsburgh, back back in Pittsburgh, the sure throws of Terry Bradshaw would account for a Steeler margin of victory. Bradshaw, like Anderson, took what the defense would allow and patiently probed the Broncos with short passes to his setbacks, which eventually opened up seams in the Denver secondary. The primary Steeler target was number 88, Lynn Swan, who burned the Broncos for two touchdowns, won a 43-yard beauty. Swan's second score was equally impressive and ushered Pittsburgh to victory 20-9. Down the road a bit, the Steelers and the Bengals must meet twice, and they will no doubt be key games in determining the eventual champion of the rugged AFC Central Division. In Three Rivers Stadium, the Steel Curtain did the bump. Led by Joe Green, the Steelers are free and easy during pregame. But once the gun sounds, their pranks become pitfalls for teams like the Chicago Bears. The Steelers have been known as hitters throughout their history. Now that they are no longer losers, this unbridled savagery has turned them into winners. The steel curtain rips into offenses like hacksaws, chewing up offensive lines and running backs. A man like Ernie Holmes, number 63, uses quickness to channel the play back into the pursuit. According to one coach, Jack Ham, number 59, fights off blocks better than any linebacker in the NFL. Each member of the curtain has meshed his individual skills into unit play and the result is harmony and a Super Bowl championship team. To blend with their defense, Pittsburgh has an offense that is balanced and versatile. The Steelers have runners who can catch and receivers like Lynn Swan, number 88, who can run to the open areas of the zone. Inside the 10, they are unstoppable. Four times they blasted for touchdowns down deep as the Steel Curtain and Franco Harris combined to crush the Bears 34 to three. The old Steel Gang barely edged Bart Starr's Green Bay Packers. 
as Pittsburgh's special teams provided all of the Steeler points. Three Roy Jarella field goals and a 94-yard kickoff return by number 44 Mike Collier. He noted a 16-13 victory for the defending world champions. Big plays by Steelers special teams will undoubtedly concern the Bengals this Sunday. But Cincinnati's biggest worry will be in overcoming the Steel Curtain defense, a well-publicized unit which last season led the entire NFL in quarterback sacks. Pittsburgh chalked up four sacks of the quarterback last week and clinched the victory on an interception by middle linebacker Jack Lambert, number 58. Pressuring the quarterback into costly turnovers is a game which Pittsburgh plays well. And against the Bengals this Sunday, the Steelers will need to apply plenty of heat on Paul Brown's field general Kenny Anderson. Up is only slightly worse than the Pittsburgh ground game, which presently ranks seventh. Rocky Blyer gained 163 yards against the Packers. The Bengals must stop Terry Bradshaw and the Steeler offense, which boasts second place in total offensive rating. Bradshaw, who frequently strays from the pass pocket, found life rough last week and was unable to finish the game following a sideline somersault. Bradshaw's injury is believed minor, and against the Bengals, the six-year veteran will be commanding the AFC's top-ranked passing club. Pittsburgh Steelers are just beginning to come around under head coach Chuck Noll, former messenger guard for the master, Paul Brown. Last week, Brown took special interest in his former pupil because Noll was now the opponent. He had brought to Cincinnati the steel curtain defense in hopes of knocking off Brown's undefeated Bengals. The game's first play set the stage for what was to follow. Dwight White left his calling card with quarterback Kenny Anderson and then went back to his cohorts to plan more atrocities. Cincinnati has a defense too. They don't have a catchy name because Paul Brown doesn't believe in such things, but they knew what kind of game this would be if they didn't retaliate quickly. So they came out determined to match the steel curtain stick for stick. For the rest of the first half, two tough defenses went head to head. In six games, Pittsburgh had allowed just 61 points, the Bengals only 70, and the field was no place for the faint of heart. But with eight seconds left in the first half and the game tied at three, the pattern suddenly changed. Steeler quarterback Terry Bradshaw found number 88, Lynn Swan, running free in the Bengals secondary. And the Steeler offense roared to life. Number 32, Franco Harris shook off the ill effects of an injured big toe and had his best day of the season with 154 yards of fancy running.
Pittsburgh broke the game wide open with two quick second half touchdowns, including a repeat of Terry Bradshaw to Lynn Swan over a fallen Bengal cornerback Lamar Perry. Then suddenly the complexion changed once more as the Bengal offense awoke. Charlie Joyner made a pretty move for one score, and Kenny Anderson came right back with his most dangerous receiver, Isaac Curtis, number 85. Curtis brought the Bengals close, and then Anderson drew in the steel curtain and executed a screen. Essex Johnson scored to pull the Cincinnati comeback to within six points with over eight minutes left in the game. The strain was beginning to take its toll on the normally stoic Chuck Knoll. Knoll knew a loss would leave his team in trouble, two games behind the Bengals. But Pittsburgh turned this dizzy game around one more time. Safety Mike Wagner intercepted two fourth quarter passes to clinch a 30-24 Steeler victory and a three-way tie at the top of the AFC Central Division. For the pleased young student, it was one more lesson on how the game should be played. For the crusty old professor, another problem to be solved in a loss that perhaps some way could have been prevented. For after 41 years of coaching, this extraordinary man who has coached more football victories than anyone else in history still seeks out perfection in a game that he has turned into a science. The rest of pro football continues to look, listen, and learn. At Three Rivers Stadium, the Pittsburgh Steelers and Houston Oilers banged heads to determine which team would keep pace with the Bengals in the AFC Central. Last season, Oiler quarterbacks were sacked 33 times, but so far in 1975, defenses have reached them on just eight occasions. But against the steel curtain, their offense was a straw man blown down by a black-shirted win. Pittsburgh's defense is the toughest unit to score against in the AFC. They take immense satisfaction in this statistic, and nowhere is it more evident than down deep at their goal line. Turnovers are a key factor in Steeler victories, and last year they caused more of them than any other team in the AFC. The Steeler defense works in perfect pitch with its offense, and only rarely does Terry Bradshaw display the gluttony for points that so characterized his developing years. Facing an oiler rush that is tied for the NFL leadership in quarterback traps, Bradshaw feathered his passes, a nuance that has turned him into a passer rather than a thrower. Receivers like Lynn Swan, number 88, have a knack for being alone when the ball arrives, a skill that is enhanced by Bradshaw's ability to buy time in the pocket. Terry, like Fran Tarkenton, has a unique gift for opening up the seams in a zone by scrambling laterally, then unloading on the run. This tactic resulted in six easy points for tight end Larry Brown and a 17-7 Pittsburgh lead. Unlike Bradshaw, the Oilers' Dante Pastorini is not a running quarterback. While Bradshaw is muscled and sturdy, Pastorini is slender as an oboe and just as fragile. His good health is vital to Houston because while their offense seems to slog along, Pastorini has the capacity and the history for producing the home run play when it's vitally needed. 
In contrast to former years when the weaponless Oilers crumbled under a physical beating, this team is resilient and stocked with players who refuse to wilt under pressure or cave in when an opportunity of the moment is lost. can pick up the shattered pieces of their game. Number 84, Billy Johnson is such a man, and so is Ken Double O Burrow, a former hot dog turned hero, and Bum Phillips' most notable reclamation project. The Euler offense is a time bomb that detonates with a flick of Pastorini's wrist. Trailing by 10 points, Houston rallied into a 17-all tie when low-slung Fred Willis, number 44, burrowed into Mike Wagner and the Steelers' end zone. Unfortunately for the Oilers, Pittsburgh slowly but surely is rounding into Super Bowl form. Like all champions, they seem to be able to produce when they are hard-pressed the most. With time ebbing, the Steelers stood 78 yards from the tiebreaker. 78 yards through a Houston defense that ranked second to their own in points allowed. Almost without effort, Bradshaw whipped his team goalward until he found John Stallworth embarrassingly open and hit him with a winning touchdown. This sure and swift execution of the rugged Oilers is a chill warning to the Bengals and the rest of the American Football Conference that the Pittsburgh Steelers are peaking at just the right moment. Blessed with a balanced offense and a ferocious defense, they wield a double-edged sword that is deliberately hacking a path to Super Bowl X. Noel is a bit more sophisticated than Bum Phillips. He savors fine wines and classical music, but he too can mold a defense. The Steel Curtain beats offensive linemen four at a time. Pittsburgh leads the entire NFL in defense, and last week they held Kansas City without a touchdown on a day that nothing went right for the Chiefs. It was just one of those days for Kansas City, but Steeler quarterback Terry Bradshaw can also find himself involved in some unusual situations. As in times past, Bradshaw evidenced a little unpredictable behavior and Pittsburgh was scoreless with 15 seconds left in the first half. But suddenly the new Terry Bradshaw surfaced, the one who leads the most prolific offense in the NFL. Number 88, Lynn Swan scored and the route was on behind the thundering rushes of Franco Harris. Harris gained over 100 yards for the 15th time in his pro career to tie John Henry Johnson's team record. Then rookie Mike Collier, number 44, wrapped up a well-rounded 28-3 pasting of the Kansas City Chiefs. Bradshaw is nimble enough to avoid the rush and actually prefers to throw on the run. Last Sunday, while leading his team to a 20-7 conquest of the New York Jets, Bradshaw not only passed for two touchdowns, but this 27-yard scramble was the longest running play of the game.
Although the mobile or running quarterback seems like a rather recent trend in pro football, it actually began in 1960 when a small preacher's son from Georgia named Francis Asbury Tarkenton signed on to pass and scramble for the Minnesota Vikings. Because he's got bad knees, he cannot move. But he does not get the advantage of being able to roll out, use a lot of play pass action, or get out of trouble. And he has to sit back in the pocket. It's a tr tremendous handicap to him. <laughs> Only a few years ago, the passing records that Tarkenton is closing in on seem like the future property of another man. But this season, Joe Namath leads the NFL only in throwing interceptions. His arm is still sound. It's his knees that are all but gone. Before each game, they are strapped so tightly in metal braces that they cut down his mobility. Said Steeler tackled Dwight White, number 78. You know where he's gonna be all the time. He's handicapped. Namath has suggested that he might retire at the end of this season. He has already retreated from the glitter of Manhattan's nightlife and rents a house in a quiet neighborhood of Garden City, a Long Island suburb. I've only been to New York City once in the past eight weeks. The traffic's too bad, says Naaman. It couldn't be any rougher than the Sunday traffic on the field. Over in Pittsburgh, the Cleveland Browns also lost, but they at least did it with dignity. Neil Craig's safety blitz was indicative of Cleveland's fired-up defense. And Mike Phipps' passing helped keep the Browns competitive in the game's first half. Shortly after this Steve Holden reception, Greg Pruitt edged over the Pittsburgh goal line to gain a 10-7 advantage. But the real shocker came on the following kickoff when number 44, Mike Collier, literally handed Cleveland a touchdown. Number 80, rookie Willie Miller recovered and suddenly halftime scores around the country incredulously read Cleveland 17, Pittsburgh 7. But Cleveland's moment of rapture was soon to wilt under the powerful Steeler attack. Number 32, Franco Harris, pounded out 103 yards rushing to exceed, for the third time, 1,000 yards in a season. Once again, Franco seems to be reaching his peak just as the playoffs approach. And against the Browns, his nose for the goal was good for two touchdowns. Throughout the second half, the Steelers moved confidently through the Browns as Terry Bradshaw to number 88, Lynn Swan, clicked for two touchdowns. At game's end, it was all back in perspective. Steelers 31, Browns 17. In Pittsburgh last week, the Bengals found that the Steelers start with talent at the top, and it goes all the way down through offense, defense, and special teams. The game, never in doubt, was a bad psychological exercise for the Bengals, who could end up playing the Steelers again on a more important level. Emotion has certainly been one part of the Pittsburgh success formula. And though this touchdown by number 36, Dave Brown, was called back, it didn't matter because the steel curtain soon came up with the play of the game. 
Number 78, Dwight White did the stripping. Number 58, Jack Lambert did the picking and flipping. And number 24, J.T. Thomas did the high stepping all the way to a 14 to nothing Steeler lead. With number 68, L.C. Greenwood leading the charge, Ken Anderson was buried in black much of the afternoon and managed only seven points for three and a half quarters, which was unusually meager for Ken. Terry Bradshaw ran into an unusual problem himself when Lynn Swan, number 88, ended up playing third trombone instead of football. His musical career a bust, Swan ended up with one touchdown and was the Steelers' leading receiver for the day. As good as Swan's way was, the real Steeler hero was Franco Harris, whose 118 yards rushing and two touchdowns kept the Bengals out of reach. The coup de grace was performed by Terry Bradshaw himself, who dropped back, found all his receivers covered, and ran it in from seven yards out to seal a very special 35-14 victory. The win was a special one because it was the Steelers' 12th of the year, the most in the club's 42-year history. It also made them the AFC Central Division champs for the third time in four years. Shoulder injury. So against the world champion Steelers, second year pro Ron Jaworski, General the Ram offense on one beautiful scoring drive in a grueling defensive struggle. Down where the yardage gets tough, Jaworski tallied the game's only touchdown. Jaworski's well-executed quarterback draw caught the Steelers napping and proved the margin of victory in a 10-3 Los Angeles win. True, the touchdown came against many of Pittsburgh's second unit defenders, while Steeler quarterback Terry Bradshaw sat out the second half. Nonetheless, the Ram victory over Pittsburgh elevated Los Angeles into the playoff limelight. But a big question still clouded their postseason chances. Gets the time, gets it off to Grossman. Gets over the 40, has another Steeler first down. The 41, stopped by Dave Elmendorf. Play action fake. Jaworski does not fool. Big number 78, Dwight White. Entertain Dallas next week, and the Rams should have St. Louis here in the playoffs when they begin. How about that? <laughs> That's Glenn Edwards. Oh, what a beautiful move. What a beautiful move. Glenn Edwards, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> First and 10 Pittsburgh, their own 30-yard line. Franco Harris. Franco Harris tacks on some more yards, heading towards another 100-yard night. Eddie McMillan made the stop on the big man. Mess up in the backfield, but Harris comes away with it after flattening quarterback oh. Bradshaw. He gets nine yards. What a precision play, Frank. Picking and weaving and finding his spots when the spots are apparently not even there. Even more See, Robinson turned him in. Even more remarkable when you consider this guy is 230 pounds. Just stripping tacklers away from him. He Kill him with the play action thing. Oh, Pass out there intended for Mike Collier. I could have called that one, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it... 
Collier. Collier gets down to the 21 yard line, hit there by Ken Getty. Carroll with a lot of foot. Dave Brown at his own 24. Brown all the way to midfield, the rookie from Michigan, the number one draft pick of the Steelers. Hit there by Al Cowlings. Chuck Noll looking on. Gives the Steelers the ball at midfield. Gillum's the quarterback. Harris still the setback. And still running and running well. Six yards. Down to the 44. Second down and four. Hit there by Fred Dreyer. Go Harris. Harris. To the 40-yard line. Just short of a first down. Hit there by Dave Elmendorf. Frank O'Hara still the running back. And no one does it quite like that. Out to the 34-yard line. Cost, Rocky Blyer. Blyer, first down and plenty more. Put it away if they can get their field goal. Rob Scribner, stacked up. The Colts have done well by their optimism, however, and when you think of how far they've come from just a year ago when they were licking the wounds of a 2-12 and campaign, you can get a pretty good idea of the sense of accomplishment and pride they brought into their playoff game with the Pittsburgh Steelers. 75 had truly been a season of great destiny for the Colts, but in the Pittsburgh Steelers they face pro football's sternest challenge. As reigning world champions, the Steelers were in the playoffs for the fourth straight year. And with a 12-2 record, many consider this year's team their best ever. With only two starters over age 30, the Steelers are young and exuberant. And last weekend, they herded the Colts out of the Super Bowl roundup with a performance that convinced many Pittsburgh fans to confirm their reservations down in Miami. And true to form, it was the Steel Curtain defense that closed Baltimore's miraculous season. And while the Colts' running game was stopped cold by the Steelers, Burt Jones' aerial efforts were being defensed with equal rigor. Unfortunately for the Colts, their very first series proved disastrous, as number seven Burt Jones almost lost his head, then scrambled his way into a freak injury. Number 24, J.T. Thomas, hit Jones in the throwing arm. And on the sidelines, it was obvious that the Colts had lost the services of the man who had led them to a 28-point game average. For the next two and a half quarters, the only bomb Jones would be connected with was the analgesic variety. Meanwhile, out on the field, the Marty domrys led Colt offense was sputtering under the sudden change of command. Individually, Domrys was less than impressive as he completed only two of 11 passing attempts covering a total of nine yards. But with guys like L.C. Greenwood lurching into his pass pocket all afternoon, Domrys was facing a formidable task. One of Domrys' few completions led directly to the Steelers' first score, as number 59 Jack Ham came up with a turnover late in the first period. On the very next play, Terry Bradshaw to Frank Lewis, gave the Steelers lots of yardage and even more momentum. Three plays later, the Steelers were poised on the cold eight yard line and number 32, Frank O'Harris, rumbled in for six points. It was Franco's only score for the game, but his presence weighed heavily in its outcome. Ironically, Franco could well have been the game's goat, as twice he fumbled on critical occasions. One fumble resulted in a cold field goal, and the other one spectacularly squiggled away to short-circuit a Steeler touchdown drive.
But while Frank O'Harris was having a bit of trouble finding the handle, his 153 yards rushing completely overshadowed the errors. In 27 rushes, Franco blasted out 5.7 yards per carry. And one of the reasons for his success was the blocking execution of number 20, Rocky Blyer, who time after time sprung Harris into the Colts secondary. But Franco was not alone in the mistake column last weekend. As in the second quarter, Terry Bradshaw mistakenly threw a pass to number 42, Lloyd Mumford, who quickly set up Baltimore's first and last touchdown. Mumford's 58-yard return put the Colts in position, and Marty Domres, finally getting some protection, found poet Glenn Dowdy all alone in the Steeler end zone to make it 7-all. Without Burt Jones, the Colts had come back to tie the Steelers. And just before the first half concluded, Terry Bradshaw rolled right and was up in it by ever-present Lloyd Mumford. Portentiously, it appeared the Steelers, too, had lost their quarterback. As Bradshaw, in obvious pain, was helped from the field, the victim of a sprained knee. As the third period started, Colt head coach Ted Marshabroda watched as his team tried to convert a Franco Harris fumble recovery into a touchdown. But then the Steelers came up with the first of three game-deciding defensive plays. Number 58, Jack Lambert, deflected the pass, and the Colts were forced to settle for three points and a 10-7 lead. On the Colts' next series, L.C. Greenwood was the hitter. And Lydell Mitchell, the hit E, as the Colts were stopped cold by an aroused Steeler defense. And it wasn't just the linebackers in front four who were playing well, as Domries found trouble wherever he probed. Number 47, Mel Blunt, came up with his 12th interception of the season and a play that Chuck Noll later called the game's turning point. With the ball on the Colts' seven-yard line, the Pittsburgh offense took the field with number 12, Terry Bradshaw, in full command of the helm. Bradshaw had come out to play in the second half and was gimpy, but nevertheless gained. And down at the seven, all he had to do was hand off at number 20, Rocky Blyer. He did the rest. Blyer's touchdown made it 14 to 10 in favor of Pittsburgh. And soon afterwards, Terry Bradshaw boosted the total to 21 to 10 on a short hop over center as the man least likely to run culminated a Pittsburgh march. Immediately, Burt Jones came on to ignite a few final moments of drama. His shot to Glenn Dowdy covered 58 yards and suddenly it looked like it was going to be a 21 to 17 ball game with two and a half minutes left to play. But then from the Steeler three-yard line, Jones set up to pass when number 59, Jack Ham, jarred the ball loose. Number 34, Andy Russell, scooped the fumble up and headed for the goal 93 yards away. According to Jack Ham, Russell was running so slow, he couldn't tell if he was running for a touchdown or running the clock out. But the 34-year-old Russell made it to the end zone without a delay of game penalty and the Steelers were assured of their 13th victory in 15 games by a margin of 28 to 10. At game's end, the Colts' thoughts turn to next season. While for the jubilant Steelers, there's this week in the Oakland Raiders for the championship of the American Football Conference and an invite to Super Bowl X. And as the clock ticked the final seconds off, the expressions of Terry Bradshaw Tell a lot about the pressure of championship play.
and the satisfaction of being a winner. On a steel-gray December day, the second season began. Playoff time brought the sky-high Baltimore Colts to Three Rivers, but their storybook season was about to be spoiled by a brutally basic Pittsburgh ground attack. Franco Harris gained one yard less than the entire Baltimore offense. Then the men in black put it away for good. Fittingly, an elder statesman accepted the honors. Andy Russell set a playoff record for elapsed time during a 97-yard touchdown run. Pittsburgh eased home with a win, but a stiffer challenge was yet to come. For the second consecutive season, the championship of the American Football Conference comes down to the same two teams, two bitter rivals, the Oakland Raiders and Pittsburgh Steelers. Over the past decade, no team in pro football has achieved as high a level of success during the regular season as Oakland, an achievement that has now carried them to that last step toward the NFL championship for the sixth time since their last and only appearance in the Super Bowl in 1968. However, with that unparalleled level of achievement has come an unmatched history of agonizing disappointment. The Raiders have had no less than five chances before today to take the final step to the Super Bowl again. They have not made it yet. The Raiders' chances today are less than ideal, for they face the defending champion Steelers on Pittsburgh's home turf. It is tough enough for any team to beat the Steelers in Pittsburgh, for their partisans have been known to literally rock Three Rivers Stadium. And playing before this very vocal and very faithful audience is difficult enough. But when you add the fact that Oakland has never won a playoff game on the road, the Raiders must be considered decided underdogs. But for today's game, you can throw away the history books. The biggest factor may be the weather. 20 degree temperatures and 20 mile an hour winds have turned Three Rivers synthetic surface into an ice skating rink. Freezing faces, freezing feet, and freezing fingers plus frozen field equal an uncertain situation for both teams as the Oakland Raiders face the Pittsburgh Steelers in the NFL Game of the Week and carries. Rocky Blyer got just three yards, but Terry Bradshaw, about whom there was a great deal of concern due to a knee injury suffered last week, was able to move quite well, and he provided almost all of the Pittsburgh offense in the first half with his well-aimed passes. Bradshaw would move the Steelers fairly well, the three interceptions that he threw in the half would limit the Steelers to just three points. For several plays after this one, Mike Wagner made a brilliant interception. Wagner picked a bad place to pick a fight, for he was soon surrounded by silver and black and decided to go the discretion route as far as Valor was concerned. Affected both teams about equally in the first half, continued to take its toll in mistakes. There were five turnovers in the third quarter alone, as each team strained for the advantage that would alter the Steelers' fragile three-point lead. Soon after number 58, Jack Lambert recovered the first of the three fumbles he would capture for the day. Two plays later, Madden had even more reason to yell when Clarence Davis coughed up the ball to Lambert at the Pittsburgh 30-yard line. This time, the turnover paid off in a score as the Steelers marched 70 yards in just five plays. 
their best drive yet by far. The touchdown drive began with a fine catch for 10 yards by Swan's replacement, John Stallworth, and number 41, Phil Villapiano's version of the late, late, late show, cost the Raiders an additional 15 for unnecessary roughness. On the first play of the fourth quarter, Franco Harris took Bradshaw's pass in the flat, then flattened a few Raiders to bring the ball 17 yards to the 25. On the very next play, Harris got the remaining 25 yards in one fell swoop. The Steelers have the first touchdown of this cold, cold day. Another look at it shows a fine crackback block by Stallworth and a very poor tackle by Colsey were the prime ingredients in Harris's touchdown run that put Pittsburgh ahead 10 to nothing. Number 57, Sam Davis, made a key block, riding Ted Hendricks around Bradshaw, who snapped his pass right to the spot where number 45, Neil Colsey, another victim of the ice, had stood. A look from behind documents the play in Stallworth's solitary splendor as Pittsburgh's second touchdown seemingly put the game out of reach of the Raiders. The 6-2 Stallworth is just one of many interesting stories on the Steelers' championship team. A fourth-round draft choice from Alabama A&M last year, Stallworth became a starter as a rookie. This season, he lost that job through a succession of injuries and the return to form of Frank Lewis, who is now the regular. Nonetheless, Stallworth contributed immeasurably to the Steelers' great season. His play on the special teams has been exemplary, and his touchdown against the Houston Oilers was the winning one in the big game for both teams. Thirteen yards later, Terry had a first down, but had been knocked silly doing it and his replacement, seldom used second string quarterback Terry Hanratty, entered the game. Up for the 42nd time today, and Cliff Branch came down with it on the Steeler 15. But that was all, time had run out. The Pittsburgh Steelers had won the rematch and had their second straight conference championship winning 14 of 16 to do it. The scoreboard told the story. Pittsburgh was in the Super Bowl again. In an icy AFC championship, Pittsburgh faced arch rival Oakland, a playoff opponent for the fourth consecutive year. The chill factor was sub-zero, but Steeler fans persevered. A sea of black and gold had come to pay homage to the conquering hero. Let's go, Steelers! Come on! All right, all right! Let's go! All right, yeah! I'm going to hit it hard, and you just make sure you get outside, because I'm coming, I'm hitting that, I'm hitting it like a bitch. Get up, 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 get up.
bitter battle began to take its toll on both sides. Then, through a gathering storm, the game turned on two fourth quarter plays. struggle the Steelers had endured for a 16 to 10 victory. Dumps it off to Franco Harris. 40, 45, 50, and in Oakland territory. Right. At the Oakland 47, where Gerald Irons and Monty Johnson got him. To Harris, cut back. Now he's starting to rumble. He can make all the difference. The time pass for it. Slip, he throws, and he gets his first down. 
And he hit that tight end, Randy Grossman again. Number 84, Randy Grossman. He gets away. He's at the 35. And down he goes at the 30. Looked like they had him completely stopped. And his running ability was the dimension there. Second down eight. They draw, look, look out, he's back again. They sent Andy Russell, the right. linebacker flexing. They failed to pick up the flexing linebacker. They pass it out again, he flares it to Vanisak at the 20. Fumbles the ball. And up with it is Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh comes up with it. Jack Lambert. Number 58. It's a second down. Five to go. Davis. Ooh, fumbles the ball. And the Steelers have recovered. Now they're all fumbling. Once again, Oakland fumbles it away in Pittsburgh territory. And there's Jack Lambert who recovers. Each team has fumbled the ball away twice here in the third period. Pass on a deep drop. The pass out. What a catch! by John Stallworth. And her crowd now roaring to should be a late hit on the play. Situations, let's see what he's going to say. On the 43-yard line of Oakland, the flare pass out to Franco Harris, who shakes away. He's to the 30, and he barrels his way uh -huh. to the 25 of Oakland. He put a move on Monty Johnson that just comes out of sheer instinct. He is a, a swing pass man. There it is, Wayne. He's outside. Gets away. Oh, oh, oh. He's going. He's in there. Frank O'Hare scores. Uh, he's got to really be happy. He gets better as the game goes. Moves it to the outside. He shakes a block out here. Coles is the one that should have got him, but I just, you know, that guy's big and strong. You don't realize. Franco, 220 pounds. Posey came up, who's a heck of a tackler himself. Just bounced off of it. Here's another look. Neil Posey, a pretty sure tackler, took on a big man the wrong way. 25-yard run by Harris. Harris is past receiving and running now. That put the Steelers out. Drifting, he got away. They have a touchdown. A Raider man fell down. Neil Colsey fell down. John Stallworth caught the ball. Colsey slipped and fell. They had him double covered in the end zone. He had it pretty well played. Colsey did. He really almost got away right there. It's pretty good protection. See if we can see this. Colsey's there. He slides down. He's in front of the receiver. Stallworth kept his feet. That's it. Bradshaw, dancing away, and the oh, pass right. is complete. Well, first oh. down to the tight end, Randy Grossman. He Good hasn't got a lot of long ones, but he certainly got some mighty important short passes yeah. today. Bradshaw, first down, flips it to Harris. Oh. Harris puts it to 40, down to the 36 yard line. Bursting for a first down, Michael Harris. Oh, you're right. When you say that the longer the game goes, longer. the better he gets. He yeah. sure does. He just seems to wear everybody off. Down. They got from behind. Oh. There's a drop ball. Ball was dropped. No interception. Third down play. That's uh, coming out of that pocket. And he has the first down. He runs it to the 40-yard line of Oakland. Well, I'll tell you, he's been outstanding in this cold. First settled down last year at the end of the year. Become really an outstanding quarterback. When he's come out, they got to hit one. And that's it. There he goes with a bomb to Branch. Branch. He caught it. Has the ball and fights his way. Hands out. Oh, he's not out of bounds. It's all over. Now look at that Time field. is out. Ranch caught the ball. 
Down around the 15-yard line, but couldn't fight his way out of bounds. That's giving him the best uh, the, effort. The Raiders went down to the wires just as much as the team ever could in almost a hopeless position. John Madden disappointed again. But reversed it, went for the field goal, came back and went for the onside kick. They are, they came right back. Lynn Swan's sensational catch was the catalyst in this touchdown drive. And as we view it again, notice the tremendous body control that enabled the flying swan to stay inbound. The doomsday defense dug in at their own 16, but were unable to stop the inevitable. Pittsburgh's touchdown had come on a short rollout pass from Terry Bradshaw to Randy Grossman, a second-string tight end from Temple University, known for his sure-handed catching ability. Only a lack of blocking ability stands in the way of first-string status for the glue-fingered Grossman. Number 58, Jack Lambert's wicked tackle of ex-teammate Preston Pearson signaled this not-so-subtle change of momentum. Second quarter began with Dallas on Pittsburgh's 14, safety Glenn Edwards missed a golden opportunity to go coast-to-coast. Coast. With Pittsburgh getting the best of it. Old buddy Pearson seemed to be an inviting target, and although he caught five passes today, the ex stealer was limited to merely 14 yards on the ground. As the half wore on, Staubach found himself the victim of an increasingly ferocious pass rush, led by L.C. Greenwood, Ernie Holmes, and Dwight White. The most celebrated member of the Steel Curtain defense, Mean Joe Green, playing injured was not a factor in the game and was removed after the first half. Swan again teamed up for a sensational play. Another look at Lynn Swan's incredible catch shows that he was well covered by number 46 cornerback Mark Washington, who couldn't overcome Swan's acrobatics. Staubach locates secondary receivers, but he never looked anywhere except at his primary receiver on this one. And J.T. Thomas read Staubach's eyes and stole his pass. Thomas returned to the Dallas 25. It was just the type of big play defense that Pittsburgh thrives on. But the Steelers went away hungry this time as Bradshaw's third down pass spoilers and further advanced Pittsburgh's cause. Cowboy defensive back Cliff Harris, number 43, had unknowingly aided the Steelers by his actions after Jarella had missed his short field goal pop. A 
further Lambert quote, we were intimidated in the first half, and the Pittsburgh Steelers are not supposed to be intimidated. Indeed, they were not in the second half, and they were ready for anything Dallas threw at them. Though the Dallas offense was ineffective, their defense was playing well, and the Cowboys carried their 10-7 lead into the fourth quarter. Then on the Steelers' first play of the quarter, the Cowboy defense chased Bradshaw out of the pocket. But Bradshaw made a great throw to Franco Harris, who almost turned it into a big, big play. Harris, however, stepped on the sideline after his catch. The Steelers did not get the touchdown and could move no farther. But Harris' 26-yard reception gave Pittsburgh better field position from which to punt. But Dallas was in a hole. Forced to punt from their own end zone, the Steelers went for the big play. Pittsburgh bomb squatters Dave Brown, number 36, and number 46, Reggie Harrison, ganged up on Roland Wolsey, number 45. Wolsey took Brown, and Harrison was in free. Harrison spiked the ball out of the end zone for a safety, making the score 10-9 Dallas. But it did much more, for Harrison had literally nearly eaten the ball. I heard a boom and felt a shot. It cut my tongue. I never did see the ball, said Harrison. Teammate Ernie Holmes said, what's a little thing like a cut tongue? With the money he's going to make, he can buy himself a gold one. That did it for us, said Lambert. And it did, for the Steelers made a five-point play out of it, advancing the subsequent free kick into field goal range at a 12-10 lead. The sharks of the Steelers' defense must have really smelled Harrison's blood. For on Dallas' first play after falling behind for the first time, Mike Wagner streaked in and stole Staubach's pass. Wagner carried to the Dallas 7, but the Cowboys refused to fold and forced the Steelers to settle for a field goal and a 15-10 lead. Dallas was unable to move on their next possession, but they did force Pittsburgh into a third and four when Terry Bradshaw struck for one of the greatest plays in Super Bowl history. Lynn Swan had beaten Mark Washington again, and looking at the play from the end zone reveals why. Washington was in single coverage for number 43, Cliff Harris, had safety blitzed. He was chopped down by Rocky Blyer. His blitz unsuccessful, the Dallas secondary weakened. Bradshaw's pass to Super Bowl X most valuable player, Lynn Swan, had traveled 60 yards in the air and hit him right in the hands. The pass is even more remarkable when Bradshaw is isolated. Stepping up in the pocket, Bradshaw avoided D.D. D. Lewis, number 50, who had also blitzed. Then threw that perfect 60-yard pass despite Larry Cole's brutal hit. After two first downs, Staubach saved the Cowboys when he recovered a bad center snap and had the presence of mind to throw a pass. It was incomplete but stopped the clock, something the Cowboys could not have done having no timeouts left. Another incompletion left three seconds on the clock, and 80,000 fans who had witnessed by far the most exciting of all the Super Bowls watched as Super Bowl X came down to one last play. Starbucks' desperate heave for miracle worker Drew Pearson was intercepted by Glenn Edwards, and when he touched down, the ball safely in his grasp, the Steelers were world champions for the second year in a row. 
With their 21-17 victory in Super Bowl X, the Steelers joined the Green Bay Packers and Miami Dolphins as the only back-to-back -back winners of the Super Bowl. It's a remarkable achievement, joining these two legendary teams. Not tarnish a golden season. They lost to a great football team, the Pittsburgh Steelers, victorious in Super Bowl X and champions of the National Football League for the second consecutive season. Welcome to sunny Super Bowl X against the Dallas Cowboys. When holder Bobby Walden and kicker Roy Jarella missed a first half field goal, number 43, Cliff Harris, celebrated prematurely. The tactic backfired as Jack Lambert set things straight. Harris was quickly whisked away from danger, but Lambert played the rest of the game with controlled fury. Lambert's play inspired the entire Pittsburgh defense. And for the first time in years, the Super Bowl was truly super. Dallas held its own, but this was an uphill fight against a team built strong in so many ways. A defense of skill and daring. Powerful big back running game. Swarming special teams which contributed a safety to the cause. A poised and polished quarterback and his host of gifted receivers. But above all, a Super Bowl showcase for an artist named Swan. In Super Bowl X, the Pittsburgh Steelers defended their world championship with courage and class. But the best is yet to come. They are young and eager for more. A team with a blueprint and a title.